Okay, we are in Tri Cities on what is this? Twenty second. All right. What do I do? With my glasses today. Are we organized? Are we? <laughs> Shut up, Bernie. <laughs> We may have to lay hands on you again. (laughs) Okay, brethren. I just want everybody to understand just how human I really am, you know. We have been starting a series on the fruits of the Holy Spirit, which um, it's interesting, as I mentioned, when I went through and organized my sermons, um, I realized that almost all of our sermons that are Christian uh, living type sermons are fruits of the Holy Spirit sermons. So it's almost, or it's difficult to uh, under or overstate how many fruits of the Holy Spirit there really are. Galatians 5.23 doesn't sum it up. It's just the barest uh, description. I uh, should mention, by the way, that this hall will, will have the same policy that only water in the, in the congregation during services, not coffee, please, so that we don't have any carpet issues as time goes on. So water only in the, if you feel the need. My wife says we went for many, many years in the church and never had any water you know, in the congregation. So that's a concession, preferably in bottles if you can do it. But anyway... Uh, You and I have an obligation. We don't have... It's not an optional thing that we show forth the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And it never ceases to amaze me when I have people tell me that they'll make some kind of a posting on Facebook, which uh, I don't do Facebook, but I know there are friends of mine who are very much into Facebook. But they'll make a posting on Facebook and somebody will take it upon themselves to come down on them for something that they've chosen to do. And we're not talking about, you know, have a baby out of wedlock or something like that. We're talking about just individual choices of life. And it always kind of takes my breath away that people can sit in church and not pay attention to what is taught or think that it only applies to the other person and not them. Um, I'm a minister of God. I'm a minister of Jesus Christ. And I very rarely would take it upon myself to correct somebody. Um, Here we're not talking about, you know, if Paul even uses the term within our area of responsibility. Uh, You know, we have very definite areas of responsibility. Within those areas of responsibility, which are based upon doctrine, then I'll say what I need to say. But even then, I won't necessarily, you know, I don't try to analyze everybody's life and see how you, you know, what particular way do you need to be corrected today. I don't think that way. I'm not critical of all the choices you make in life, even though I recognize you make a lot of dumb choices. You know what? So do I. Uh, That's called human life. Um... We, we counsel, we advise, we, we do give counsel when we're asked. Uh, very often, if we're not asked, it's not any of our business between you and God. Now, at the same time, I'll teach very strongly, and I teach very strongly against the idea and the spirit of judgmentalism. God did not put you on the earth, or me, to sit in judgment of our brother. God put us on earth to sit in judgment of ourselves. And that is the, that beam in the eye that Christ talked about. The full-time job we've all got. I'm amazed that anybody has any time left over to sit around and pick at somebody else and their choices. Mankind chooses his fruits. And one of the principles of the liberal spirit, and by the way, and I'm not talking politics, although politics is an expression of that. The liberal humanist secular spirit is the spirit of Satan. The spirit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm going to be the authority that decides what's good, what's right, what's wrong. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, that's not your choice to make. God determines what's right and what's wrong. 
One of the key things Satan does in inculcating a society with a spirit of humanism, secularism, liberalism, is to break the tie. How many of you go back to the Mr. Armstrong era and remember how he used to harp, at least that's the way we used to put it, on there is a cause for every effect. Do you know the liberal mind doesn't recognize that? Because they can honestly say, you give us $4 trillion for education and we produce a lousy product, give us $5 trillion. We'll fix it. Whereas the logical mind would say, look, Jack, we're wasting our money with you. I think we better go back to the drawing board. Maybe we made some fundamentally wrong decisions. The liberal mind sees no connection between what I do if I have good intentions and the results. Good intentions, I've got a whole sermon on that. Good intentions are not good enough. You look from Genesis to Revelation, you'll never see any place that God gives anybody credit for good intentions. Oh, you meant well. No, God is focused on what you did. Your fruits. If we purport to be Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, we don't have an option to show forth the fruits of God's Holy Spirit. We have things to work on. Now, I completed... Uh, what was it, 12 sermons, 11 sermons, 11 sermons on the Ten Commandments. Not because I came up with a second commandment, or an 11th commandment, but because I gave two sermons on the Sabbath. And I hope everybody, one of the purposes of fully comprehending what our task is to obey God is to realize it's more than a full-time job and we can't do it. It's impossible. Without God doing it in and through us, it is impossible. But with God doing it in and through us, the impossible becomes possible. And that's exactly the same uh, deal with any one of the fruits of God's Holy Spirit. Any good spiritual principle of life has one source and one source only. And that is God's Holy Spirit. Now there is, and there always, you know, it's funny, back in the old days in the church, we used to kind of put down the concept, as I've mentioned many times before, of human faith. There's always a human component to every one of the fruits of God's Holy Spirit. Human faith, God, Jesus Christ, respected the human faith of the centurion who wanted him to come uh, heal his uh, servant. He even praised it. The only difference is human faith by itself will get you nowhere when it comes to eternal life. Human faith is a necessary step to obtaining God's faith, the faith of Jesus Christ in and through us, and that will get you eternal life. That's true of any of the other fruits of God's Holy Spirit. You and I don't have an option. We said we wanted to be a follower of God. Okay, now, especially once you've made the commitment of baptisms, you no longer have a choice. If this book says do it, we need to get off our butts and do it. And we need to be hard on ourselves, not tolerating anything less than giving God the best effort He deserves. You and I recognize the choice, we should, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. It involves a daily, moment-by-moment choice. Where are we going to go for the fruits that we want to express in our life? To the tree of life or to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Adam and Eve chose the wrong tree. And mankind has been choosing the wrong tree for 6,000 years. Repeating each generation, repeating the mistakes and the stupidities of the prior, prior generation. And nobody seems to have learned a thing. Truly sad thing that many that God has called to his truth... When at one time they were very teachable, they wanted to learn, they wanted to be taught, they understood that they didn't understand how to live according to God's principles. Ten years down the line, twenty years down the line, now they want to be the authority. Nobody can teach them anything. They've lost the Isaiah 66-2 attitude 
and they've returned to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because when we set ourselves up as the authority, you realize most of the divisions in the church today, most of the threats to unity, and you'll hear my unity sermon that I'll be giving in Boise on the fast day. I'll eventually give it here. Almost every one of those cases comes down to, I want to be the one who draws the line on how things are to be done. It is arrogance. It is presumptuous sin that uh, Psalm 19 verse 12, I think it is. Show me my secret sins and keep me from presumptuous sins. Presumptuous sins is when you take on yourself a responsibility that God doesn't give you. To judge your brother, to judge the church. Now, each of you has areas of responsibility in your own life. You have to decide how you keep the Sabbath. Thank heaven, thank God, that I don't get a feed from everybody's house over closed-circuit television observing how you keep the Sabbath and sending you a report card every week. I wouldn't have the slightest bit of interest, thank you, in any such kind of police uh, state I, uh, approach to. You have to determine, it is within your power to determine how you apply the principles you are taught if you are teachable. It's my responsibility to teach, to correct, to exhort, to rebuke, everything else that comes down the line. But it's your, uh, it's your responsibility to apply it. That's why I don't try and pick at every one of you for you for your faults. I'm trying to work at the beam in my eye too. But too many in God's church started out with a wonderful attitude of teachability, and they wanted to learn. And they, you know, I've mentioned before the process of conversion starts out with persuasion. I'm persuaded by the truth. I've got to do a sermon on this sometime. Four points. It's just great. You're persuaded by the truth. And then, you know, I mean, you're persuaded that, that, that that's a good idea. You want to learn more. Then the more you learn, you become convinced by the truth. Yeah, that's right. That's really true. Then you move on to being convicted by the truth. Meaning, now i got to do something about it. i got to, you know, quit my job and find another job as a Sabbath issue or whatever it is. Only when you're through those three steps are you ready for the fourth step, which is conversion. You know, 99 per, well, sorry, 85 percent or 90 percent of the people in worldwide got stuck on one, two, or three and never made it to four. The only thing they got out of baptism was wet. That's why when I counsel somebody for baptism, I always say, you know, my job is to counsel you. My job is to give you the information. My job is to teach. My job is to ask you questions, make sure you understand the commitment you're making. But ultimately, when you have to make a commitment between you and God. And God has to look down at you and say, okay, he's authentic. He's ready. I'm going to give him his one chance at salvation. I don't determine that. All I do is baptize and lay hands on so I always uh, encourage people, the major thing they should search for or seek from God in baptismal counseling is conviction. Convict me, Father, just as much as the Jews were convicted in Acts 2.37. They were cut to the heart and said, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's a great attitude to start out your conversion with. You know something? It's a great attitude to remain in for the rest of your life. That teachability is all too lacking today and too many people have their own ideas about anything in particular. They want to be their own authorities. And you know, God, the interesting thing is God doesn't come down the moment we start being self-willed and starting pushing our own ideas and slap a silly on the spot. He says, okay, you want to be the authority? You don't want me to be the authority anymore? Because you don't, you know... Most people do it on the basis, I don't understand how, I don't agree with how the uh, the church is doing, or whatever. And it's it's like they are demanding God operate on their terms. Well, you know, there's a reason he put Isaiah 55, 7 through 9 in there. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. My thoughts are higher above your ways than the heavens are above the earth. He's basically telling you, don't expect to put me in a nice little box and understand me, because you're not going to be able to. Most of the time in our relationship with God, we've got about 479,000 different ways in which I don't understand why 
God says, yep, Isaiah 55, 7 through 9. Next, next, next issue. As we begin working our way through the fruits of the Holy Spirit, which includes, you know, what I, when I started this series originally, um, we were talking about it, uh, Galatians 5.23 as the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But as I worked through it and began to realize how much more extensive it is, we'll get into a lot of other topics that are fruits of the Holy Spirit. But so far, the first message I gave was on whether or not we are converted at all. Paul asked that question, and I quoted that scripture. And we need to ask ourselves, am I converted? If I was hauled into court on the, on the charge of being a true Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict me? We have to show forth the evidence, the fruits of our conversion. Second uh, uh, sermon I gave, next sermon I gave, was on joy. And we talked about the Christian form of joy. You know, the amazing thing is, our society, if you were to ask most young people today what the the purpose of life is and they would say they have fun that's kind of like pursuing joy only thing is most of them will admit that they never get it they have to keep pursuing it harder and harder to get the same thrill ever known an adrenaline junkie they start out you know mountain biking and then they get into skydiving and then they get into mountain climbing without ropes and then they you know, they have to go harder and harder and harder to get the same thrill and eventually they end up at the point that Paul, uh, Solomon ended up it's all vanity they're empty people pursue all kinds of things with a purple passion to try to fill the emptiness in their lives you have the opportunity to understand what the purpose of life really is, to obtain true joy, which has nothing to do with a publisher's clearinghouse or the lottery. So as we move on, we'd like to take a look at the concept of Christian peace. What does it mean to have the peace of God as a gift of the Holy Spirit? The two primary words translated peace... In Hebrew and Greek, in Hebrew it would be shalom. We've all heard that term. And it's interesting how shalom does not just mean peace in the sense that, um, well, of course, this would scare a lot of urban dwellers today, but I remember once I was going down to visit one of our most remote members, if you know Pete and Naomi Casey down in uh, the boonies of uh, extreme southeastern Oregon. Um, and as I was driving across a 50 mile long gravel road to get to their place, I stopped in the middle of the 50 miles and pulled off the side of the road, and they're a fairly desolate area if you know eastern uh, Oregon, and this is in January I think, or well I don't know, it was, it was winter anyway, and I just turned off the, the van and walked out into the field because I wanted to listen to the silence. It was wonderful. I, th- I think my blood pressure went down ten points right on the spot that is an expression of peace don't get me wrong but it's interesting that the shalom actually and the Greek word does the same thing it actually includes peace being more of a total body experience it means health it means wholeness completeness, soundness soundness of mind, soundness of body now, many of us are at the point where soundness of body is kind of not on the table anymore, um, which is the way I feel with, with my bad heart. Um, but we, that doesn't mean we can't have or be given the fruit of God's Holy Spirit, which is peace. Um, and uh, the Hebrew shalom, for instance, means completeness, soundness, well-being, and occurs when one is in harmony and accord or agreement with, with others. Does this relate to unity? You bet it does. People who are continually floating because they're not committed anywhere, they don't have peace. 
And sometimes when they encounter people that are sure of, of, uh, of their calling, sure that they're doing what God has called them to do, they look upon that as self-righteousness. And for years, you know, I got that thrown at me because I'm confident where I am. I know what God called me to do and what He has for me to do. doesn't mean I understand everything because I don't. In fact, as time goes on, I oftentimes feel like I understand less and less. But there is a peace with knowing I'm doing what God is calling me to do. I'm not doing it perfectly, and sometimes I don't even do it very well. But I know what, I, what my job is. I know what my purpose in life is. I know how I fit in the scheme of things. I know my place. I know my place is not to sit in judgment of others, whether in higher authority above me or not. It's not my job to sit in judgment of you. There is a lot of peace that comes from knowing your place in God's scheme of life. The fruit of man's way of life, which is actually Satan's way of life, if you will remember Mr. Armstrong used to talk about this all the time, vanity, jealousy, lust, and greed. None of these are compatible with peace. When somebody is pursuing, like for instance, um, a lot of times, I've seen people go from being relatively normal human beings to giving in to sexual lust to an extent that, again, anytime somebody, let's say, well, I've had counseling situations where a guy was arrested trying to set up something he had set up over the internet with a, uh, a teenage girl. Okay? That happens only when it's been actively developed within the mind over many years before person people act it out. By the time they act it out, they're pretty far along. They're pretty far gone. And that's one of the reasons people, when they're pursu- pursuing perversion or drugs or anything else, you need to, need to push harder and harder to get the same thrill. And they really pervert their minds. What is it going to take to turn some of those people around? I really don't know. I think there will be a lot of healing of minds that you and I need to do in the kingdom of God. Because the minds as they're currently structured are not compatible with repentance. They won't even identify with a concept of repentance. Vanity, jealousy, lust, and greed. All of those different expressions of Satan's spirit can be pursued to a degree that it can kill our salvation. And they are totally incompatible with the concept of peace. And it's important that we understand that God's concept of peace is more than just quietness. It's more than just not having somebody shooting at you this week. I mean, is that a component of peace? Yeah. But you know something? You can read accounts of people who achieve peace of mind, not fruit of the Holy Spirit but they understood the principle involved they achieved peace of mind while in a Nazi death camp Jews have decided you know I'm powerless they have total power over my body but they don't have power over this I'm going to decide to be happy just if nothing else to spite the Nazis I've read accounts like that and I admire people who can who can figure out that that is you know Christ talked about that. Don't worry about the person who can destroy your body. Worry about the one who can destroy you, your spirit, your eternity. That's the one you need to worry about. Talking about himself, of course, and his father. The degree to which we lack peace in our lives is the degree to which we are out of harmony with the mind and the spirit of God. That's an important thing to understand, brethren. I'm going to repeat it. The degree to which we lack peace is the degree to which we are out of harmony with the mind and the Spirit of God. I've illustrated it before that we are called, this is God's way, this is man's way. Perpendicular to it. We are called to bring ourselves into alignment with God's way. It doesn't work the other way. That's why God says... And first, well, is it James now? Somebody corrected me on that recently. But I, can, uh, I don't have the scripture written down, so I'll just quote it to you. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. How do you resist the devil? Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Everywhere in the Bible, 
The only time God took the initiative is when He called you. From then on, you have to take the initiative. And He responds. But you have to draw near to God, and then He will draw near to you. It doesn't work the other way around. So the concept of peace, in a spiritual sense, is much more than just quietness. It's, just, it's much more than not having somebody shooting at you. It involves a lot of things, including emotional maturity, emotional control. Ever dealt with somebody that primarily makes their decisions based on their spleen? (laughs) Or other body parts, as the case may be. They do not make wise decisions. They make decisions based wholly on emotion or something similar. From an old correspondence course, the Ambassador College correspondence course, God's Spirit brings peace contentment and peace of mind but human nature is always striving to obtain more for the self it knows no rest, no relaxation it is full of worry fears and frustrations that's the way of human nature God's nature is entirely different and we are called to reflect his nature not the nature of Satan And brethren, I hope that you very rapidly come to a conclusion you can't do it on your own, because you can't. But with God, God, all things are possible. Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59, beginning in verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Why does he put it that way? Because that's the way human nature thinks. God doesn't respond as quickly as I think he should, therefore his ear is heavy, he cannot hear. No. But your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies and your tongue has muttered perversity. No one calls for justice nor does any plead for truth. They trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. They hatch vipers' eggs and weave the spider's web. He who eats of their eggs dies and... From that which is crushed, a viper brings, breaks out. Their webs will not become garments, nor will they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and their, the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their path. The ways of peace they have not known, and there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. Now, it's not hard to see that this world doesn't have a lot of peace of mind out there. In fact, there are a lot... I have to tell a little story on my wife. My wife has not had a chance to do a lot of visiting with me, and um, as far as go-to type visiting. And there was an individual who uh, uh, requested a visit, and and, uh, uh, I knew this was going to be an interesting visit, uh, but I didn't give her a heads up. Maybe that was anyway. My wife is, as as you talked with her, she's bubbly, she's vivacious, she's. Friendly, and so she comes into this person's apartment. It's immediately just chattering away, in 90 miles an hour, and and then the more he talked, the quieter she got, because he was talking about these demons that were talking to him, and you know how he he does he tries his best not to listen to them, and and the guy had pretty major problems, and her eyes started to get a little bigger, and and as I say, she got real quiet, uh, and I. Not him. I feel sorry for this guy, and, 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 and I'll get to him in a minute. But I almost wanted to laugh because she was being freaked out a little bit by all this. And I have dealt with these situations before. I'm at the conclusion, brethren, we're going to have a lot of people we're going to have to heal the minds of in the, in the kingdom of God. There's no solution in this life. I have not seen very many people. In fact, I've seen no one with mental illness of that degree ever be healed. And believe me, God can heal a mental illness just like he could a physical illness. 
So I've never seen it happen. And I've seen very few people with significant mental illness who've been able to operate in a church environment. In fact, I asked Carl McNair about that once, and he said basically only one or two people in all of the time in his ministry. And I can say in my 12 years in the ministry, only one or two people have I seen who've been able... And that didn't mean they still didn't have problems. Not necessarily demon problems, as in this case, but uh, you can have... It seems like there are certain things that happen in a, in a mentally unbalanced mind that are biochemical as much as they are anything else. And uh, the fact that a person even repents of what brought on that mental illness doesn't make the mental illness go away. Just like I have repented of my diabetes, and God hasn't taken it away from me yet. <clears throat> sure hope he does at some point. But the way of peace is something that's very easy that we can see in the world. The world is not filled with peace. Am I telling anybody something they don't know in that regard? Okay. Unfortunately, have we seen expressions of the spirit of sin that was described here in the Church of God? Isaiah or Galatians 5.22 talks about the fruits of the flesh. We've seen... I mean, we don't... Not too many murders. Hey, well, there were... A number of murders that happened up in Milwaukee recently, or in the past ten years. We've seen the spirit of murder, which if you recall my Ten Commandments sermon, what the spirit of murder is all about, gossip, criticism of other people, it's the spirit of murder. We've seen every one of the expressions of what the world has, but we just don't aren't as bad with it. It isn't as bad in the church of God. If a pound of arsenic will kill you, believe me, an ounce won't do you any good either. We're not called to not be as bad as the, as the world. We're called to the strive for a, toward a measure of the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. So don't let your standard of judging yourself be this world. Oh, I'm not as bad as the world is. Okay, that's not saying a whole lot. Our standard should be Jesus Christ, the very highest standard. And on that basis, we've seen people who don't call for justice or plead for truth within the church of God. They're ambitious. They're seeking an office. They'll put up down other people. They'll pull a rug out from under other people. It always amazes me, people who play games like that, who don't realize... God pays attention to all that. If he's counting the number of hairs on your head, believe believe me, he's paying attention to what we're doing, the choices we're making. And you may get what you want, and I've seen people get what they want. I remember a guy I used to be in business with. I think I've told you this story before, where he said that... uh, And at first I thought he was kidding because I was so appalled. Um, He said any time that his name wasn't mentioned three times by the minister on a Sabbath, he considered it a a, a wasted Sabbath. What can you say in the face of something like that? And uh, uh, the thing he wanted most on earth was to get himself ordained. Well, eventually he got himself ordained. And then he left this other group he went with, and now he's got his own little group. Behold, he has his reward. And they have theirs as well. Every one of these expressions of the spirit of Satan has its flavor in the church if we allow ourselves to reflect more of the world than of Jesus Christ. There are ways that produce peace, and those are the fruits of God's Holy Spirit, the obedience to God and fulfilling what he has called us to do. Proverbs 15. And what do we see, by the way, in the church of God today? If you were to look at the general 450 community of the Church of God, do you see peace? No, you see chaos and confusion. Why does anybody think that's a good idea? But there are people out there that do. Proverbs 15. Verse 15, all the days of the afflicted are evil, but he who is of a merry heart has a continual feast. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fatted calf with hatred. 
There are many rich people in this world that sit down to a fatted calf and have no peace. You may not have much, brethren, but if you have the peace of God, you're wealthier than Bill Gates. Romans 8. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Okay, we shouldn't have too much difficulty understanding what's being referred to there, the way of this world. But those who live according to the Spirit have to set our minds on different things. And the fruits of that should be evident. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. For the carnal mind is enmity, it's that conflict with God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So it doesn't matter how nice a person they are. doesn't matter how, you know, one of the biggest hurdles that I uh, come in counseling prospective members is they have to come to understand that God is not trying to save the world. And all those good people out there are nice people as far as it goes. That doesn't make them Christians. There are certain very rigid criteria as to what makes a, a, uh, a valid Christian given in God's Word. And one of the first things, Acts 5.32, God gives His Holy Spirit to those who obey Him. So if they're not keeping the Sabbath, you just eliminated 90% of the world right there. But, hey, we all keep the Sabbath on the Holy Days. Yeah, so do the Jews. And they're not converted. There are ways of God that produce... And it's interesting how he, in some of these summary kind of verses, like we're reading in uh, Romans 8, uh, he ties peace in really quickly. It's like one of the fundamental fruits of God's Holy Spirit. Peace of mind. Peace of place. Confidence of place. Knowing where God wants us to, to be and what He wants us to be doing. From the Correspondence Course, Lesson 47, God wants us to be in His kingdom. He wants us to come to Him for forgiveness and the power to grow in His character. He wants us to ask Him to help us overcome sin in our lives and live by His commandments. Do you ask God in your prayers every day to help you to overcome, to convict you of your sins, to help you to repent and to change your life? You should be. And I recommend you pray. I've incorporated in my daily prayers Psalm 1912. Show me my secret sins. Show me the sins of which I am guilty that I cannot see. Because the normal default state of the human mind is blindness. We are blind to our own faults. We can be blind to our friends' faults too, but generally we're not. Generally we've got pretty good blazer vision like Superman when it comes to other people's faults. But we're blinder than a bat when it comes to our faults. I've described it before and I think this is one of the best analogies that God has ever inspired me to come up with. You and I are surrounded with a cloud of confusion. Our minds are surrounded by a cloud of confusion. The confusion it consists of your bad habits, your bad programming and your upbringing, all your bad education, all your bad thoughts, all your bad sins. And all of this forms this huge cloud around us that we cannot see clearly. God, on various occasions, will cut through that cloud. And, you know, what brought this to mind initially was that as a minister, so often I'm forced to make a decision. And I pray about it, and I pray about it, and I pray about it. And what I'm seeking is for God to part the clouds, and the heavenly light shows down, and I have the definite, you know, stamp of approval answer from God, and now I don't have to think anymore, I just do what He tells me to do. You know, He doesn't operate that way. However, there are a few times in our lives where He will cut through the clouds. 
One of those times was when you were called. When God cut through the cloud and enabled you to understand His truth and be convicted by it. That's why I talk about it being a miracle. It's totally supernatural. didn't happen naturally. Totally supernatural. It was a miracle. He can do it again if you ask Him to do it. That's what show me my secret sins is all about. And it's interesting, again, I, I, you can't quote the one part of that scripture without quoting the other heart, half, which is, and keep me from pr- presumptuous sins. What's a presumptuous sin? If I'm judging you, that's a presumptuous, a presumptuous sin because I'm taking Jesus Christ's job away from him, telling him he's incompetent to do it and he needs my help. That's a presumptuous sin. Both of those, and presumptuous sins result from blindness. You don't know what you're doing. You don't realize what you're doing. If you realize what you're doing, you'd wet your pants and not do it. Okay? Because it's just that serious. So God wants us to ask Him to help us overcome sin in our lives and live by His commandments. But God cannot help us unless we come to Him and ask for that help in prayer. God made us free moral agents. We must choose to rely on Him and ask for His help, to humble ourselves, recognizing our innate weaknesses, and depend on Him for the spiritual strength we need. So pray to God every day and ask Him these things. Pray continually, regularly, fervently, and expect God to answer you. You must establish a regular habit of daily prayer if you expect to be born into God's kingdom. You must maintain personal contact with God to receive His gift of eternal life. When you do, your prayers will accomplish a miraculous change in your life through the power of God's Spirit. And you will achieve the very purpose for which you have been born. Now, it's important you understand that in 90... 9% of the cases that I've dealt with, well, okay, 95. I'll give you the 5%. There are times when you ask for God to do something and He does it quickly. And generally I'm always surprised when He does it that quickly because I'm so used to Him saying, okay, fine, I'll take it into account. I'll get back to you on that. You know, um, a friend of ours up in Alaska, I mentioned this, had that great saying, which is, if you ever see something wrong or something you need from God, pray about it and wait 10 or 15 years and He'll, he'll answer you. Because sometimes that's what He does. He'll take care of the matter, but it may take a few years. He'll do it on His terms and He'll do it His way. And never approach God from the point of view of, okay, if I ask three or four times, you got to give it to me. <laughs> he doesn't operate that way. Um, By the same token, when you pursue and you ask for something, I've used the analogy before, if you had a little boy who came to you at five years old and said, Dad, I want a tricycle. He asked you one one day and then he never said anything about it again. Never said boo, grew up, bought a car, moved out and whatever. Never asked you again for a tricycle. How much do you think he wanted that tricycle? Okay? Now, if ever you've done this with one of your kids where they wanted something and they really wanted it they were the importune widow they brought it up and brought it up and brought it up until finally okay I surrender I'll get it for you whatever it might be Well, plus frankly as God uh, Christ said you know we love to give good gifts to our children too and if your kids really want something it's a joy to be able to give it to them but the principle of the importune widow is if it's important you better not just ask God once. You should ask God every single day. And there's certain things I ask God for every single day in my prayers. It takes time, but you know, a lot of times when something's really important, you pray about it, you pray about it, you pray about it, like let's say for three or four months, and then you get away from it for a while. And then one day you wake up and realize, wow, God answered that prayer two months ago and I didn't even notice That is oftentimes the way it works. God is your Father. He likes giving you good gifts, things you want. So you ask Him for something that's good, like one of the fruits of His Holy Spirit, you think He's going to say, nah, not this week. No, He's got to, of course I'm going to give it to you. How much do you want it? 
Show me how much you want it. John 6. John 6, verse 53. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father, so he that feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. We must live spiritually on the nourishment of the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ. Some of you may recall my sermon, which I'm thinking of giving in Australia when I go down there, because it's one of my most popular sermons at the feast, on how important are you to God. Individually, he chose to sacrifice his life so that you can have the opportunity to experience what he experiences. I can't imagine any greater love than that. 1964, there was an article in the Plain Truth on emotional control that brought up some good aspects of this. I'm going to read through some of that. God's Word points out to man... The only true way to real peace of mind, health, and happiness. Great peace have they which love your law, and nothing shall offend them. That's a very good memory scripture. Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they which love your law, and nothing shall offend them. Let me give you a little hint to your Christianity, brethren. Make it a goal of yours. To never let anything or anybody offend you. Period. For any reason, any way, any manner, shape or form. Try and develop that as a... I've dealt with too many people who purport to be Christians who are proud of their offense. Who only will forgive on conditions that fulfills what they expect. They'll forgive you if you crawl in the right way to them and kiss their feet. Your obligation is to forgive. And if you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. And it doesn't matter whether the other person has repented at all. If you truly understand how important forgiveness is to your forgiving others is to your receiving forgiveness, you remember my sermon on preemptive forgiveness. You, you will fall all over yourself to forgive people before they even do anything to you. Because you understand how desperately you need God's mercy and you don't want anything to interfere with that process. Continuing with the article, Learn to love and obey God's word. Then you can have perfect peace of mind. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. It's Isaiah 26 verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Once man begins to keep the laws and commandments of Almighty God, then and only then will he have peace of mind, health, happiness, and the promise of eternal life. And you see how health is tied in with that peace of mind? Most of the illnesses that we suffer with have an an emotional component. You went to college and you took college uh, psychology 101. You remember the fancy dancy term, cognitive dissonance. That means a conflict in the mind. Um, one expression of it is guilt. Guilt is a wonderful thing if it impede, er, impels you to repentance. Otherwise, it's useless. It's worse than useless. And I tell people, you know, this issue of forgiveness is fundamental to your sanity, spiritual sanity. And it's also fundamental to your health. And you know one of the people you need to forgive the most? Yourself. And believe me, 
anybody who's too hard on themselves to forgive themselves is telling Jesus Christ he's incompetent. It's just that offensive to God. God chose to forgive you. How dare you not forgive yourself? Once man begins to go, I already read that. My son, forget not. This is Proverbs three one through two. My son, forget not your law, my law, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days, long life, and peace shall they add to you. So notice, if you keep God's law, long life and peace are the natural results of that. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, depart from evil. It shall be health to your navel and marrow to your bones. That's verses 7 and 8 of uh, Proverbs 3. Again, God always ties peace into health. That doesn't mean um, you can't achieve peace of mind even if your body's already shot. Because a lot of us, especially with the gray hair, we've done what we've done in life. And we've reaped what we've sown. And we are where we are. And sometimes God heals us of these conditions, but sometimes He doesn't. And frankly, I'm working on a sermon on principles of health. This church, the people of God, has got to get their act together on this. I am appalled at what most of you eat. I have sat across the table from some, and this is again where I'm not being critical. I didn't jump on the guy. But he ate stuff that no human being ever should be stuffing into their mouth. We're not talking about pork. Back in the 60s and 70s, we, 50s and 60s and 70s, we understood the principles of health. And this church was much more health oriented. Too often, and I'm giving away part of my health sermon, we live like the world and then go to God and say, fix it. God says, like... I'm not going to fix that until you fix what you can fix. We eat what the world eats. We do what the world does. We watch what the world watches. We think like the world thinks. We run around like a chicken with a head cut off like the world does. And then we go to God and say, fix it. He's going to say, no, you got a few things to fix first and then we'll worry about fixing you. So, anyway, that's another subject entirely. (laughs) Continuing from this uh, PT article, He who is filled with the love of God will not have fear because perfect love casts out fear. 1 John 4.18 He will not have hatred toward anyone because he will obey obey God's command love your neighbors or sorry love your enemies bless them that curse you do good to those that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you Matthew 5.44 and you know that's a principle that you can read over and think "That's, that's cool I can do that until you have somebody really do you dirty I lived a good part of my life and thought I didn't have any enemies And as far as I'm concerned, I don't have any enemies. Now, there's some other people that have a different opinion on that subject. And I have found that, that, you know, you can intend not to have any enemies, and you'll have them anyway. But, and some of those enemies can really do you dirty, or do your family dirty, or do dirty on somebody you love. And that's when it's hard to live this scripture. When you're... 16 years old, you haven't really had any enemies and everything's been, been good times up to that point. It's, yeah, that's a nice scripture. Isn't that a nice scripture? To live it is a whole different ball of wax. And if you don't have any enemies le- uh, yet, uh, once you finish growing up, you will. And when you do, you'll understand what the scripture is talking about. <coughs> Someone who is filled with the love of God will not be weighed down with feelings of guilt. He knows that he has repented and God has forgiven him of all sins. 1 John 1, nine. He who is really filled with the true love of God will not hate anyone. 1 John 3.15 He will not fear anyone or anything, including death, for he has said, this is from Hebrews 13.5, He has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Such a person will not worry about the future. He will have serene faith in God's promise. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in the glory of Jesus Christ. Uh, Philippians 4.19 He will not be frustrated, plagued with emotional upsets. 
which besets the average pers- person, and these things lead to sickness um, and early death. Only through the indwelling presence of God's love, His Spirit, can man ever learn to control such emotions as hate, worry, and guilt, which make the experience of God's peace impossible. Today, millions are slowly committing suicide by harboring wrong emotions. Countless millions of people are sick, mentally and physically. How can man ever acquire a sound mind and body? From Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, This is the end of the matter, all having been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this makes a whole man. If we keep all of God's commandments, he will become a person will become balanced, whole, sound as an individual, both in body and in mind. Yes, Jesus Christ knew what he was talking about, and he literally meant what he said when he solemnly declared in John 10:10, 10, 10, "I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly." Only through heeding the word of God, keeping his commandments, and living by his laws can mankind ever attain to real health, happiness, peace of mind, and eternal life. Mankind is currently committing suicide, slow suicide, and this is how you can put a stop to it. Now, I hope that we all come to understand that This kind of peace of mind has nothing to do with your material state. You have brethren in the hill country of Burma that live effectively in the Stone Age. They literally don't know where their next meal is going to come from. Or they might have a little bit of rice set aside and that's about it. To say that they're poor, uh, it's not an adequate word. But they can have the same peace of mind and the same joy of life that you can have. And interestingly enough, maybe they get it better than we do. Because through the apostasy, more of them survived than survived in the United States. More than 90% of them got through the apostasy, as I understand it. Sometimes having nothing means that your life is a lot simpler. You're not distracted very easily. This article went through. By the way, the reason I didn't tell you who wrote the article is the man didn't live it. The man lived it for many years and then he lost it at the end. It's a sad story and I saw him lose it. I remember him sitting out in the congregation at my feast site in Prescott looking a lot for all the world like he just sucked on a lemon. And that's the way he and his wife were. They no longer had peace of mind. They no longer had emotional control because they got caught up effectively in power lust. All of these disputes in the churches of God oftentimes refer or revolve around power lust, even though we're only talking about power over an increasingly smaller number of people. At least, you know, I always used to say with the Takash crowd worldwide, there were assets there to fight over. There were things to lust after. But in the global split, the exact same thing happened. There was no assets. Methods were the same. Attitudes were the same. What does that tell you about who's behind it? Satan is the epitome of vanity, jealousy, lust, and greed. And so he works that in us. And the real shame is how often it works for him. The article went on to talk about seven of the uh, most or the wealthiest men uh, at a conference in uh, uh, the 1920s and how 25 years later, most of them had either committed suicide, had gone to prison. Oh, she, she wants me to read it? Well, I, I'm, I'm running out of time, babe. I can't read it. I can't read it all. Okay, these guys were, you know, um, president of the largest gas company in the, in the United States uh, became insane. President of the largest independent steel company died a fugitive from justice and penniless in a foreign land. Greatest wheat speculator uh, died uh, abroad bankrupt. President of the New York Stock Exchange uh, went to prison for 25 years. 
a member of the president's cabinet was pardoned from prison so he could die at home. This is after 25 years. One of the greatest speculators on Wall Street died, uh, committed suicide. Head of the greatest monopoly at the time uh, died a suicide. President of the International Bank of Settlements uh, died a suicide. The world thought these were successful men. They lived in big fancy houses and drove big fancy cars and ate in big fancy restaurants. And they were insane. Because that's what it is. When you don't have peace of mind to the extent that you commit suicide, that's a form of insanity. That's the fruits of choices you made. Choices that are totally incompatible with peace of mind. So don't drive by any of the fancy neighborhoods here in Tri-Cities and envy them. Because you don't know what goes on behind those doors. Chances are you are infinitely... Well, in fact, no, I take that back. Chances are you are infinitely wealthier than they are. And it has nothing to do with money. The spiritual fruit of peace is a gift that naturally results from harmony with and unity with the mind of God. Psalm 37 Psalm 37, verse 11. The meek shall inherit the earth and delight themselves in the abundance of peace. He's making a tie between, direct connection between meekness and peace. What is meekness? Uh, Meekness has the unfortunate thing of sounding like a bad word called weakness. Meekness has nothing to do with weakness. Meekness is one of the greatest spiritual strengths you can have. Meekness is submission of will to God. Total submission of will to God. The meek shall inherit the earth and delight themselves in the the abundance of peace. In verse 37 of the same chapter, Mark the blameless blameless man and observe the upright, for the future, future of that man is peace. And we read Psalm 119, 165, Great peace have they who will love your law. Peace have they who love your law, and nothing shall offend them. Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3, verse 13. Happy is the man who finds wisdom, and the man who gains understanding. For her proceeds are better than the profits of silver, and her gain than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. So he's contrasting what the world lusts after, more and more money, more and more material things, with the spiritual value of of wisdom. Length of days are in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy all are all they who retain her. And then you can read Isaiah 11, where the lion lies down with the lamb. One of the idyllic pictures of peace. What will need to take place for that utopia to be set up? That's why I, I like to remind everybody, Mr. Armstrong had it right when he said... You can know what is uppermost on the mind of God. What is at the forefront of His mind. At the forefront of God's mind is the reestablishment of His government on this earth. Because everything good stems from proper government. And you had better be learning proper government now if you're going to be doing it then. God knows mankind can't have a... It wasn't the set ten suggestions or the ten guidelines. It was the ten commandments. And you know, just think back. Cain knew God. He talked face to face with God. You couldn't tell Cain there isn't a God. He knew there was a God. And he did his own thing anyway. And he set up his own pagan religion anyway. 
wrap, meditate about that for a while. It's because God did not enforce his way upon Cain for 6,000 years, mankind. There have been times when people have known God face to face and because he didn't enforce it, they went their own way. Because that's what he's doing. 6,000 years, you go your own way, do your own thing. Reap your own fruits. You're being prepared for a world where it's not going to work that way anymore. I like to put it that God is, you know, you are going to give mankind, after you're resurrected, three choices. You're going to do it God's way, God's way, or God's way. There's no fourth choice. Everything stems from proper government because proper government is the enforcement of God's way. So you read Isaiah 11 and brethren, that's on the level of platitudes. It sounds nice, we're so familiar with This is going to happen. And you are going to be the ones. You're the ones who are preparing to make it happen. Catch the vision of that. I'm already over time and I've got four more pages of notes. Um, Isaiah 32, verse 17, the work of righteousness will be peace. You can't develop, uh, or untie peace from righteousness. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33, but God is not the author, author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. Unfortunately, that's not true today. Or at least, the principle is true. Our implementation is not. Ephesians 2, verse 14, talks about Christ being Himself our peace. Because you and I are supposed to be living the life of Jesus Christ again. He and His Father come and make their home in and through us. You represent 24-7 the family of God. Be aware of the family reputation every second of your life. This is an important scripture. We'll turn to this. Ephesians 4. And interestingly enough... What is Ephesians 4? Ephesians 4 is the government chapter where God sets up and describes the government of God. Mankind didn't design design it. God designed it. Ephesians 4 verse 1 I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called in all lowliness and gentleness with long-suffering, bearing with one another, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, not 450, one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and in all and through all and in you all. I like to point out that proves that Paul was a southerner. In you all? Okay, never mind. Um, talks about uh, Philippians 4. I'm trying to skip through a bunch. Of, I got a lot of scriptures here to read, but Philippians 4, verse 7 talks about the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. It's not something that's logical to the human mind. It's a gift of God. Verse 9, The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you if you do what you are instructed to do. James 3, verse 18, Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And this is an important principle too. You can only be and fulfill the beatitude of being a peacemaker if you have peace to make peace with. You have to have the peace of God in you to be a peacemaker. A peacemaker is not a doormat. That doesn't mean you need to, to, to let anybody do whatever they want with you. A 
A peacemaker is somebody who has peace with which to make peace with, who approaches life from the perspective of the peace of God. 1 John 4, verse 18. 1 John 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. So if we don't have peace of mind, it's not God's fault. It's our fault. And we need to pursue it. The lack of peace of mind is an indication that things are not right between us and God. We're not living our calling enough. That doesn't mean, by the way, I don't want to be too hard on people from one point of view. If you were called into the church at 50, or 30, or 20, or whatever, and you were raised in a family of depressives, ever been around a family who were all negative and depressive? I have. You cannot overcome that like that. You can pursue peace... But it's going to be a harder thing for you to exhibit this kind of a fruit. So this may be one that you stress more than another one. Um, You could grow up in a family that had no rules, no boundaries, and so therefore the concept of temperance and self-control just doesn't work in there. So you have to pursue it more. All of us have a different mix of things we have to pursue. So don't be too hard on yourself if you... Did your programming is and your cloud involves a lot of depressive, negative type thinking. But realize that's not where you're supposed to stay, even if that's where you were called. And God can give you a different spirit from your programming. Remember Isaiah 58 when it talks about fasting? It says, one of the purposes of fasting is to break the bonds of wickedness. How do you do that? By fasting diligently is one of those ways, and receiving, therefore, from God the ability to show forth a different spirit than what comes naturally to you. 2 Timothy 1 2 Timothy 1, verse 6, Paul reminding Timothy, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands, the Holy Spirit. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You get the impression that Timothy had a a bit of a problem with being timid. Being intimidated by the fact he was a young minister and people were holding him in contempt. Because you hear Paul tell him several times over, you do your job, you fulfill your minister ministry. You correct and rebuke and exhort and instruct with all confidence. Now, obviously it didn't come naturally to Timothy. Peace is a byproduct and only operates within the context of faith, submission, and obedience. So peace, you cannot, as with the Ten Commandments, as with the other fruits of God's Holy Spirit, you can't pull one fruit of God's Holy Spirit out to the exclusion of everything else. They're interrelated. Peace is tied in with faith intimately. Tied in intimately with obedience, with submission of will. Romans 5. Romans 5 and verse 13. I'm sorry, verse 1. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace through, with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith to His grace, into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations, pr- tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. 
Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit which was given to us. That sounds pretty flowery. But what he's saying is that it's all tied in. The peace of God is something you can have in a death camp. Because it's based upon your relationship with God and the degree to which you have submitted your will to Him. Romans 15 verse 13 ties in peace and hope and joy all together. Romans 15 verse 13, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So what have you got there? You've got faith, hope, joy, and peace. One scripture. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you have that power in your life, brethren? Well, there's not one of us in this room who has enough of it. But do you realize how great a blessing it is to be given the possibility of true peace of mind? It has nothing to do with whether your dog bit you when you were two years old or your mommy was mean to you when you were a baby. You know, all the things the world likes to look at as excuses for why I can't get my act together. We can get our act together. We just have to pursue God's mind sufficiently and He'll make it happen. We are called as God's elect to do His work, to understand the purpose of human life and to share that, to understand our place in the work in the government of God and the plan of God understanding how God intended life to be lived and learning those principles that we're going to be teaching in the very short future we have been called to peace John 16 and verse 33 These things have I spoken to you, Christ said, that in me you might have peace. In the world you're going to have tribulation. He says, get ready for it, that's the way it is. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. That almost seems contradictory to the human mind. How can I be of good cheer when I'm in the midst of tribulation? You know, grab anybody walking by on the street out there, they have tribulation too. Go down to the local children's hospital. They have tribulation down there too. The difference is they don't have the opportunity to benefit spiritually and eternally from their tribulations. You do. God didn't call us to a cushy life. He didn't call us to a bowl of cherries. He called us to a more abundant life than we would have otherwise had. And anybody who doesn't feel that they've gotten that, your values are in the wrong place. God's peace is not a peace this world understands or identifies with, nor is it a peace that comes naturally to the human mind. It is an express gift of God's Holy Spirit, a manifestation of the mind of God, evidence that Jesus Christ is living in us again, and God the Father as well. So it can sometimes be a difficult question if you don't feel like you have the peace of God enough. Because that's quite, that's, do you have the peace of God in your life, brethren? If not, why not? Let me give you a hint. It's an awful lot like the expression, um, I don't feel very close to God. And what's the answer to that? Who moved? He didn't move. We moved. If we don't have the peace of God, it's simply because we're not close enough to God. We're not obedient enough to God. We're not pursuing God with all our hearts like we're called to do. We aren't as submitted to His will as we should be. We aren't focused on doing God's work as we're called to do. Let's all strive to show forth abundant evidence of the fruits of God's Holy Spirit in our lives by striving with all of our minds not to reflect the Laodicean spirit but the Philadelphian spirit of zeal and dedication and fervence and pursuing God with all of our hearts and our minds and our spirits and our lives time is short and it's important that we feel the urgency brethren we have to show God 
we have accepted his calling and we want what he has to offer. We can set up religion according to our own desires. He'll let us do that. And many in the so-called church of God have chosen to do that. Okay, we can choose that. We will reap what comes with that and believe me, we're not going to like the results of that. Or we can choose to pursue God in a convicted manner with all of our hearts, our minds and our spirits and we'll reap far different results and rewards from doing that. Feel the urgency, brethren. Drive and prod ourselves. But in the process, let's strive to make the peace of God something that we ask God to give us and to show forth in our life. Because He knows how to give good gifts to His children. He wants to give you peace of mind, peace in your life, joy. We have to pursue it so that's what I'm calling us to do in all of these sermons on God's, the fruits of God's Holy Spirit is to value and pursue those fruits.